Good morning, everyone. Good morning. My Bible is open up to Genesis, the 29th chapter, and I'm going to invite you to be opening up a Bible to Genesis chapter 29 as well. We're going to read some verses there in just a moment that will help to, uh, to, to set up and provide kind of a launching pad for the things that we want to talk about today from the Word of God. So let's be working together in the text of Scripture. What a beautiful first day of the week the Lord has given us on this final day of the month of May. I'm so glad that I get to share this day with you in this way as we reverence God together through the study of His Word. And I want to get right to it. In Genesis chapter 29, as we are reading about the dysfunctional relationship, the dysfunctional marriage that existed in the household of Jacob, we read in Genesis 29 beginning in verse 31... Now the Lord saw that Leah was unloved, and so he opened her womb. Leah conceived and bore a son and named him Reuben. For she said, Because the Lord has seen my affliction, surely now my husband will love me. Then she conceived again and bore a son and said, Because the Lord has heard that I am unloved, he has therefore given me this son also. So she named him Simeon. She conceived again and bore a son and said, Now... Now this time my husband will become attached to me because I have borne him three sons. Therefore he was named Levi. I must tell you that I appreciate Leah for being a solution-oriented person. I just always like folks who are problem solvers, folks who see a problem and then they set about the task of resolving that problem. Uh, Leah is a fixer. That's what we call those folks. She's a fixer on her marriage. There's some things in her marriage that are not what she wants them to be. Jacob is not giving her the attention and the affection that she desires. And so she attempts to fix that problem by having a baby. In fact, Leah is not the first person and the only person to ever do that. Lots of people throughout history have thought that the solution to marriage problems was this very thing. Let's have a baby. Maybe by having a baby, maybe he will start being more grown up. Maybe he'll be more responsible. Maybe he'll be a better leader. Maybe if we have a baby, that'll cause him to to spend more time at home and give me the attention that I crave and that I need. Why, if we'll have a baby, that'll be the thing that'll help us to bond and grow together as husband and wife. Let me ask you, how'd that work out for Jacob and Leah? It didn't. Having a baby, having seven babies, that was not the solution for the problems that existed in that relationship. Yet the truth of the matter is, married folks often do resort to faulty tactics, faulty philosophies that don't actually fix problems. No, many times they end up exacerbating problems. I want to say this morning that if my wife and I are having problems in our marriage, I don't want to invest time and energy in things that are counterproductive. You know, look at Leah here. She spent years of her life chasing after Jacob in all the wrong ways and it never resulted in a happy marriage. I don't don't want to do that. I don't want to listen to what the conventional wisdom of our culture says. I don't want to listen to what the so-called relationship experts have to say. No, what I want to do is I want to hear what God has to say so that I don't fall into the trap of trying to fix problems with help That doesn't actually help. This morning what I'd like to do is I'd like for us to continue our preaching theme for 2020 on marriage matters. And I do want to talk about marital conflict, but I want to talk about that from the standpoint of what doesn't work in resolving conflict. And I want to do that by setting before you three flawed and broken philosophies that we often encounter when dealing with marriage troubles. I want to show you from the Word of God why these three ideas are faulty, they are filled with holes, and I want to show you what the Scripture says in a constructive way for dealing with conflict in our marriages. Are you ready for that? Let's just start that by debunking this first widely held belief, and that is the mistaken notion that absence absence makes the heart grow fonder. How many times have you heard that before? I've heard that all throughout my life. That's just one of those good old time, you know, folksisms that's just been passed down. And the idea here is that, hey, 
If you're having a little bit of trouble in your relationship, if you're not getting along as husband and wife, if you don't enjoy talking to one another and seemingly it's getting worse and worse every passing day, well, the solution is simple. You just need to spend some time apart. That's what you need to do. Maybe one of you needs to go on a vacation without the other one tagging along. Maybe what one of you needs to do is pack up some of your stuff and and go to your friend's house for the weekend. Maybe even what one of you needs to do is pack up your entire suitcase and you need to just move out of the house for a good long while. And what will happen is, is that separation, that being apart, it will cause you to realize just how much you love one another. And so you will then yearn for what is missing and the end result will be you'll come running back to one another just as fast as you possibly can. My question is, how's that working out for most folks? Now, I understand that there is a sense in which the sentiment behind absence makes the heart grow fonder. There's a sense in which I get that. It's not a completely false or bad idea. You know, about the only time that I'm ever away from my wife for any extended period of time is when I'm in a gospel meeting far away. If I'm a couple of hundred miles away and it's not within driving distance and so I'm going to go, maybe the church is going to put me up in a hotel and I'm going to be gone for three or four days, five or six days at the most. And I understand about that. When I'm in a meeting like that, I miss my wife. I do. It makes me want to get home just as soon as I possibly can. I want to see her. I want to spend time with her. But you know what? Even when I'm gone and away from her for something like that, something very interesting begins to happen, usually about the midway point of the week. And that is I start getting comfortable in my independence. Do you know what I'm talking about here? I like being able to just hop in the car and go over to the Waffle House across the road at 2 a.m. in the morning. I can do that when I'm by myself. Or you know what? I like the freedom of being able to just kind of hang out after services are over and just talk with folks. And I don't have to be looking at my watch worrying about getting back to the house at a certain time. Why? Because I'm independent. This independence thing, hey, it's got some perks to it. I kind of like that, but, but whoa now. I don't want to get comfortable in independence. I don't want to get comfortable with being apart and separated from my wife. That's dangerous. Now please don't misunderstand me. I I, I understand about husbands and wives from time to time kind of doing some things independent of each other. That one of them maybe goes on a knitting retreat for the weekend and the other goes on a hunting trip for the weekend, and after the weekend is over, they come home together, and she brings a big deer, and he brings in a scarf that he knitted, and they share... Oh, wait, hold on. It's the other way around, isn't it? Yeah, that's usually how that works. I get that kind of thing. And I believe that there there is a place for that. I think that can be constructive. But what I'm talking about this morning is this thinking that if we're having problems, that if we're having issues, that the way that we can fix that is through separation? I want to say this morning that that is false. Strength is built through togetherness, not separateness. In the book of Genesis chapter 2 and in verse 24, the Bible says that God took the man and the woman and He joined them together and made them one flesh. Jesus repeated that and built upon it in Matthew 19 and in verse 6 when He said, they are no longer two but one flesh. Now, that one flesh relationship, it is shared in a variety of different ways. We are now one in the physical sense. That speaks to the sexual relationship. We become one mentally. Over time in our thinking, we start thinking the same things. We become one socially in the way that we interact with one another and with others outside of us. We start functioning as one, as a single unit. Marriage I've often thought of is, it's, it's kind of like Play-Doh. You ever taken two colors of Play-Doh? You take some blue Play-Doh and then you get some pink Play-Doh and you mush it together and you start mixing it all up and what do you get? You get, you get plink Play-Doh or something along those lines. And of course you can't just separate it anymore once you've mixed it all together, once it's become one color because now it's an entirely new color. And so to say then or suggest that somehow we need to try to pry that apart as a means of dealing with our problems, that is to fly in the face of what God joined together from the very beginning of time. 
Would you look with me in 1 Corinthians, please, in 1 Corinthians 7? In 1 Corinthians 7, if you remember here at Lakeside, you may remember last year in our Corinthians class that we studied this letter. That Paul is answering some questions that the Corinthian folks had about the sexual relationship, about the husband and wife relationship. He begins chapter 7 verses 1 and 2 by talking about that. But then in verses 3, 4, and 5, he warns against this idea of using separation as a tool for fixing your problems. Which, by the way, let me just add here, no additional charge for this. Separation? That doesn't work in fixing the problems in any relationship. You can be talking about with your friends, whether you're talking about in a family, whether you're even talking about in a church. I think even within the congregation, this is true probably everywhere, we felt some of that in the last two or three months. We've not been together as much. Less communication, less interaction, less time together. That doesn't make a relationship stronger. In fact, Paul seems to echo that here in 1 Corinthians 7. Look with me in verse 3. Paul says the husband must fulfill his duty to his wife. And likewise also the wife to her husband. The wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. And likewise also the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. Stop depriving one another, except by agreement for a time, so that you may devote yourselves to prayer. Somebody says, oh, looky there. That seems to suggest some separation. Well, Paul does say that if you do separate, yes, there needs to be some parameters to that. That number one, it's going to be done by agreement. Number two, it's going to be done for a limited time. And number three, you're not going to be separated for weeks and months on end for like just kind of an aimless purpose. No, if you do separate, it's going to be for a short time and you're going to devote yourself to prayer. Why? So that you can come together again so that Satan will not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. You know, conventional wisdom says that, hey... If you'll just spend some time apart, that hey, that'll really help you to work things out. But the Bible says that if you're spending time apart, and in particular if you're spending time apart and it's not devoted toward the goal of coming back together, we're going to devote ourselves to prayer, then what that does is that just helps the devil. It cooperates with Satan's work. Because if your spouse is not there to be with you, to be one with you, emotionally, mentally, socially, physically, spiritually, then guess what? The devil will introduce someone who will fill that role for them. The devil will introduce someone else for for them to talk to. The devil will introduce someone else for them to pour their heart out to. The devil might even introduce someone to them that they might be able to have that physical intimacy with that Paul describes in this chapter. Does God have a better way? Absolutely He does. God has a plan that is timeless and a plan that is proven. I think it's well summarized in Ecclesiastes chapter 9 and in verse 9 where the wise man says there, Enjoy life with the woman whom you love. Notice he does not say enjoy life without her, apart from her. No, enjoy life with her all the days of your fleeting life for this is your reward in life. Do you understand what that means? What that may mean is that may mean having some uncomfortable evenings at home with my spouse. Where it would have been a whole lot easier for one or both of us to just leave to spend some of that time apart, to maybe go to a friend's house and tell our friend all the things that we ought to be saying and telling to our spouse. But instead, we're going to sit there. As uncomfortable as it may be, we're going to sit there and we're going to look each other in the face, eye to eye, we're going to talk about this thing, we're going to work through this problem together. I'm going to say again, togetherness is where the strength of the family is built Not separateness. Which brings me to this second flawed philosophy that I'd like for us to think about this morning. It is something that we hear with great regularity today, and that's this. That is that money, money is the number one cause of marriage problems. I can't tell you how many countless surveys I have read where people said again and again and again that the number one leading cause of divorce in their estimation is money. 
that if your marriage is strained, if there is aggravation, if there is tension in that relationship, then there is a very good chance that money is the culprit. That if we just had more money, well then we wouldn't be fighting all the time. You know, the truth of the matter is, let's just be honest, we do have lots of arguments in marriage about money. Whether that's our bills or debts, whether that's arguing about all the things that we don't have and the things that we wished we had and the things that we just cannot afford. In fact, in some marriages, money kind of almost becomes like a child that you and your spouse are fighting over, bickering over about how to raise. I want to do this with the money. You want to do that with the money. And you know what? If we had more of that money, then we could do more of this and we could do more of that. In fact, if money could talk, yeah, I think money would probably have some things to say. We have all kinds of arguments about money. We point the finger about money. Money, you did this. And look at what money is doing to our family. Look at all the problems that the lack of money is creating in our family. But you know what? I think money, if it could speak, it would tell us that the problem is not an abundance of or a shortage of money. No, I think if money could speak, it would say to couples, Hey, stop blaming me. I'm not the problem here. I'm just sitting over here, right? I'm neutral. I'm not anything. You know what the problem is? The problem is you, husband. The problem is you, wife. It's what you're doing with money. It's what you're doing to get money. It's your attitude and your feelings about money. That's the problem. Look with me in 1 Timothy chapter 6, please. In 1 Timothy chapter 6, the Bible does say that there are some dangers that are associated with money. In 1 Timothy chapter 6, I want you to notice though where Scripture identifies that danger as stemming from. Is the danger with the money itself? Something evil about those pieces of gold or the little green paper? No. 1 Timothy chapter 6, look beginning in verse 9. Paul writes, But those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a snare and many foolish and harmful desires which plunge men into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all sorts of evil, and some, by longing for it, have wandered away from the faith and have pierced themselves with many griefs. Have you ever heard somebody say, Money is the root of all evil? Nope. That is not what the Bible says. The Bible says, The love of money is the root of all evil evil. And let me ask you this, who is it that does the loving in that scenario? It's people. People do the loving of the money. People are the ones who have the harmful desires and the longing for money that Paul describes in this passage. Money is neither good nor bad in and of itself. It's what people do with that money and their feelings toward that money. Now married folks, Can we apply that principle to our marriage? Let me say emphatically, money is not the root of the problems in your home. But loving money may very well be. It may be this misguided thinking that you know what, if we just had more money, if we had more money, then we'd have less problems. Listen to me, money is not the problem. In fact, money is also not the answer. In fact, buying into this second myth really just ends up feeding back into that first myth. Think about it. A man decides that, you know, what we need here to fix all these problems in our relationship is we need more money. And so what I'll do is I'll fix that by by, by signing up for some more overtime. I'll volunteer to work a little bit more. And yeah, that means it's going to keep me a little bit later at the office. And yeah, that's going to tie me up a lot on the weekends. I probably won't even get to come to church and do some other stuff on Sunday. But you know what? At least we'll have more money and that'll make things a lot better. Maybe even the wife chimes in and she says, you know what, maybe I'll pick up a side job. I'll do a little bit of extra work and you know what, yeah, that'll probably mean a lot less family dinners and yeah, that'll probably mean evenings at home become fewer and far between. And as that's happening, he's being pulled in this direction, she's being pulled in that direction and that togetherness is not there anymore. Separateness is what is occurring once again. And well... 
we calm our consciences by saying, well, look, at least it's okay because as long as we all come back with money, it'll all work out in the end. How many marriages have failed utterly because of this erroneous idea that how much you do or do not have has any effect at all on the love and the service that we show toward one another as husband and wife. Do you know what we really need here? You know what we need here, don't you? It's actually right here in this same chapter in 1 Timothy chapter 6. Just back up a little bit in the text. In verse 6 of the text, 1 Timothy 6 and in verse 6, Paul says there, 1 Timothy 6 verse 6, he says, but godliness actually is a means of great gain when it's accompanied by contentment. For we have brought nothing into the world, so we cannot take anything out of it either. If we have food and clothing, with these we shall be content. Contentment is what we're looking for. You know, I think about Solomon. Solomon had all the money in the world, richest man in the world at the time in which he lived. And you know what? It didn't make him happy. It didn't. In fact, Solomon is the guy who wrote that passage that we read earlier in Ecclesiastes 9 and in verse 9 when he said, enjoy life with the woman whom you love. He didn't say you're going to get enjoyment in life from the money that you have. No, it's in your spouse. And that, I believe, is the key to having contentment in the marriage relationship. Husband, you show your wife that she is enough. And wife... You need to show your husband that he is enough. That as long as we have each other, it doesn't matter how much money we have or don't have. It doesn't matter how much is in our savings account. It doesn't matter how many cars we have or how big our house is. I'm going to submit to you this morning that people who realize that, they actually are happier than the wealthiest people on this earth. That's where real wealth is found. I love the way that the proverb writer summarizes all of this, this timeless truth in this way. When he says in Proverbs the 15th chapter in verse 17, he says, Better is a dish of vegetables where love is than a fattened calf, a big nice porterhouse steak served with hatred. You know, those who know me well know that I don't even like vegetables but I think I understand what the wise man is saying in this passage. I want the love that I have for my wife to be unaffected by what we do or do not have. And even if we are having problems, what I need to do is I need to look in the mirror, I need to go to work on me and stop pointing the finger of blame at money. That's not the problem. All of that then leads me to this third and final faulty approach to marriage, a faulty philosophy whenever we're confronted with the troubles that we sometimes experience in marriage, and that is the idea that marriage marriage is a 50-50 proposition. Now, mathematically, that seems to make some sense, doesn't it? 50 plus 50 is 100%. If he's in for his 50 and she's in for her 50, well then, well then everything ought to turn out all nice and good, right? And I do think that this is the modern American way of thinking, that it is kind of a 50-50 partnership, like just kind of how it works out in the business world. Just imagine that you and someone, a partner, a friend of yours, you decide to go into business. You decide to maybe open up a restaurant. And you form a partnership with this individual. And it is. It's a 50-50 partnership. You are equal partners in this from the ground floor. Both of you own half of the business, which means you're going to be responsible for 50% of the work. Just like your partner is responsible for 50% of the work. Got 50-50 ownership. Got 50-50 work invested in it. Going to be 50-50 on the final profits, right? That's how that works. But you know what? In business... If one partner falls short, if one partner isn't living up to their end of the deal, guess what? You're going to have have a real problem there. If one person isn't doing their half of the deal, then that business is going to split. That business may collapse entirely. The partners in it may end up suing each other over, over who gets what. Is it any wonder then why so many marriages fail today? 
Because they're following after that same mentality, that same line of thinking. Husbands and wives who enter into marriage with a 50-50 mindset. You do your half and I'm going to do my half. Can I tell you the problem with that? The problem with that is if either of you fall even just 1% short, you're going to be incomplete. You're not going to get to where you need to go. And i got to tell you, I don't want to live like that. That is no way to live. That is no way to have a marriage. I don't want a relationship where I'm doing just enough and my wife is doing just enough. We're doing just enough to get us to where we need to be. Hey, I'll come halfway, and you know what? When you're ready, you can come meet me right here halfway at the 50% line, and then we'll have a deal. I wonder how many marriages consist of two people just like that. Two people who are not willing to go any further than that 50% line because they're both waiting on the other to give a little bit more. We could fix this problem in a hurry if she'd just come and do her half. That doesn't work. That's no recipe for success. I'll tell you this though. God's got a better plan. As is always the case with worldly philosophies and worldly way of thinking, God has a better way of doing things. God has something a whole lot better than this 50-50 arrangement. You know what God's arrangement is? God's arrangement is a 100%, 100% design. God says that love doesn't just bear some things. You know, look, I'll bear half of this thing and you bear the other half. Love doesn't say, I'll believe in you if you'll believe in me and I'll meet you halfway on that. Love doesn't say, I'll hope, but only if you give me a reason to hope. My my hope only goes this far. You're going to have to bring it the rest of the way. And you know what? Love doesn't say, I'll endure only if you'll endure. No, 1 Corinthians 13 verse 7 says love bears all things. It believes all things. It hopes all things. It endures all things. Love goes all the way. Love goes all in. All in. Love expresses and exposes insecurities and it puts trust in that other person that you know what? I'm coming all the way over there to you whether you come or not, it really, it really kind of is immaterial whether you come or not. I'm coming all the way to you. You don't even have to do anything if you don't want to, but I'm coming over there. I'm 100% in this thing. Love doesn't stop and wait for the other person to come and then conditionally match you step for step for step. Marriages fail when we wait on those kinds of things to happen. You know, if you are maybe struggling with and you want to better understand this 100% concept for marriage, then what you really need to do is you need to stop and you need to think about and you need to study your husband. Now, if you're a man right now, what you're probably thinking is you're thinking to yourself, well, hold on, Josh, I, I don't have a husband. Oh, but if you are a child of God, you do. Because the Bible describes that Jesus is the husband, he is the groom to his bride, which is the church. Those of us who are members of the Lord's church, we do have a husband. Now think about your husband Jesus in this way then. If Jesus only went halfway and he just stood there and he's waiting for you to come and to meet him, to match him step for step, how would that relationship work? I will be the first to confess to you that I could not do what Jesus did. I cannot match Jesus step for step. I lack the capacity to even begin to be able to do that. And Jesus knew that. And so what did Jesus do? Well, what Jesus did is He gave 100%. In Ephesians 5, where we read about Jesus and the church in this husband and wife relationship terminology, in verse 25, the Bible says that Christ loved the church and gave Himself up for her. Jesus came all the way to earth, all the way to the cross, all the way to the grave. Jesus gave all that He had to give and still, even to this present day. Jesus is giving 100% of Himself to this relationship. Now understanding that and knowing that your husband, the other half of this relationship, knowing that Jesus, what He gives to this relationship, can I ask you, 
What does that make you want to do, Christian? Does it make you want to just kind of sit back and kick up your feet and give zero percent and just enjoy all the labors that Jesus did? Hey, Jesus, thanks for going the hundred percent. That way I can just kind of sit back and enjoy. No. No, absolutely not. What it does, if you're like me, is it makes you want to go as far for Him in return as you possibly can. And you know what? That's the way that God envisioned for it to work in marriage. That if you go 100%, you're all in. And your spouse gives 100%, they're all in. And guess what? You've got each other covered. If maybe you have a bad day or your spouse has a bad day, maybe one of you has a bad week and you're kind of falling short, you're just not getting it all the way there, then good news. The other is going to be able to cover what you're lacking. God's design for marriage is that both of us, both parties, are striving to give 100% all of the time as we follow the example of the one who gave himself up for each of us. You know, there's a lot of ideas that are floated around in our world today about marriage and about how to handle the difficulties and the problems that come our way in marriage. And to be fair, some of that is worthy of our consideration. But the truth is, if any of those solutions have any merit to them at all, it's only because they are founded upon biblical principles to begin with. The psalmist said in Psalm 127 and in verse 1, Unless the Lord builds the house, those who build it labor in vain. I don't want my marriage to be built with imperfect tools that the world has offered. And then whenever my marriage is maybe in need of some repair, I end up applying all kinds of worldly faulty fixes that just don't work. Instead, God has given us a blueprint that does work. He has given us the instructions. He has given us the tools, not only to build something that will last, but He has given us everything that we need to successfully work through the problems that every marriage faces to one degree or another. And He does that so that we don't end up laboring in vain. Would you pray with me, please? Our dear gracious God and our Father in heaven, Father, we come before you so thankful for your word and for the clarity that it provides for our lives. Father, in a world that offers so many contradictory and conflicting ideas, we are thankful that you have left us with something that is certain, something that is solid, something that directs us right every single time, especially when we encounter troubles in our marriage. Father, we're asking a blessing right now on all the husbands and the wives this morning that we would be ready to dismiss and to discard the wisdom of this world and that we would be eager to accept your divine wisdom in repairing our relationships. Father, we come confessing that many times it is our own folly and our own sin that causes those problems to exist, whether it's selfishness or pride or covetousness or just apathy. Father, we're asking your forgiveness of whatever it is that we might be guilty of. Help us, Lord, to make changes and then help us to walk more faithfully in the footsteps of the one who gave himself for us. And it is in his name, the name of Jesus, that we pray. And amen.